Good evening, everyone, and um, thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Laura Corey, I'm an archaeologist, and um, today I want to talk to you about a project I've been working on at Castle Roach. So as Jean just mentioned, um, I know this is the second lecture at Castle Roach, um, that this, uh, by Castle Roach, sorry, that the Society has hosted this year. Micheál McEwen gave a fantastic lecture on the architecture of Castle Roach uh, back in the spring. And so just to say, I won't be talking about the architecture or upstanding remains of the castle this evening, although Micheál has agreed to answer any questions you may have about the architecture. <laughs> but at the end when we're taking questions. But what I would like to talk to you about is what may or may not be below the ground here. Okay. So um, so for those of you who didn't attend Michal's lecture, I will just give you a very quick um, introduction. Um, you may not have ever been to Castle Road before, you've never seen it, um, but it's certainly worth the visit. Um, it's situated in North County Loud on the Armagh border. It's an Anglo-Norman castle built in the 13th century by the de Verdens, the local Norman family in power at the time. It's reputed to have been constructed by Rohesia the Verdon in 1236. Um, and Rohesia was the granddaughter of Bertram de Verdon, who he was one of the first Anglo-Norman lords um, to come over here from England during, during the invasion. So it's recorded in the close roles of Henry the, of the, in the reign of Henry III, 1224 to 1237, that in 1235, she and Hugh II de Lacey, the Earl of Ulster, resolved a long-standing dispute between the two families. Um, it's recorded that the following year that she had built a good castle strongly uh, in her land against the Irish, somewhat, something which none of her predecessors were able to do, and that she planned on building another castle to the great security of our land. Um, but it's generally accepted now that most of what we see today um, was built by her son, John de Verdon, sometime before his death in 1274. Now, we don't know a huge amount about the use of the castle, um, unfortunately. But what we do know is that it was in ruins by 1464. And that's because we have a record that Richard Bellew um, received a grant to make repairs to the ruinous castle um, at that time. So I think it's fair to say that Castle Roach is one of the most impressive castles in, in Ireland. It's built high up on a rocky outcrop, um, and this drops away steeply on all but the east side. So it's situated on what is a very dramatic and strategic location. Um, but it's built on what was what was the kingdom of Argyla, the lands of the O'Hanlands. Um, and so it may be built on an earlier dune or another site type. Um, and I think it's important that we remember to think about that pre-Norman earlier landscape when we look at this castle and its immediate environment. So the castle itself. So this is a plan of Castle Roach um, that Ty O'Keefe has uh, put into an article he wrote in 2014 for the Castle Studies Group. Um, and I've just stolen it for this. Um, but anyway, so the castle itself, it has a large sort of sub-triangular uh, shaped courtyard um, enclosed by a massive curtain wall. Um, it's constructed of roughly coarse limestone, ashlar and grey wacky. On the east side of the castle, there's an impressive looking gate building and this served um, as a residential chamber. To the south is the large um, ceremonial hall and um, possibly a, a remains of a kitchen as well. And um, then there's also remains of a freestanding structure, um, just sort of towards the center of the courtyard here. I hope you can see my mouse there. Um, and this may have been a tower, maybe a well house um, or a later building of some sort. There also seems to be a lot of buried rubble within the courtyard, which might be buried remains of, of other buildings. Um, the castle itself is enclosed by this huge rock cut ditch. Um, and there's a stone causeway currently crossing the ditch here. Um, that's how you get into the castle at the minute. But this must have originally been spanned by a drawbridge. Uh, to the east of the castle and divided from it by the wide, wide rock cut ditch is the eastern plateau, so this area here. Um, and on this, the remains of there's the remains of an enclosing wall, a tower at the northwest corner, and some pieces of masonry kind of poking out here and there, indicating uh, buried remains. So what I'm going to say about the upstanding remains of Castle Roach, like I said, Mihal gave a great lecture earlier this year. It's still on the Society's YouTube channel, as far as I know, um, if you want to check it out. But now I would like to talk about um, what may or may not lie beneath. So this is a map from the Ma National Monuments website, www.archaeology.ie. Uh, Castle Roach is a national monument. It is in the care of the Office of Public Works and has a legislative protection. It has an RMP number, uh, LH0030290001. But as you can see to the east on the plateau, there's another red dot here, and this represents another recorded site. 
Um, and when you click on the description of this site, it's recorded as a deserted medieval village um, under number LH00302902. Uh, but when you go into the description of the site, it says under this uh, description, it says that it is thought to have been the site of a medieval borough. Evidence of the borough is slight, but it's recorded that there's a weekly market and an annual eight day fair um, had been established by 1284 and that the borough is specifically mentioned in 1332. Um, the description also states that there's remains of a boundary wall and tower, like we said, as well as a number of rectangular features within, which still can be seen. So when we talk about a deserted medieval village, um, what do we mean? We, we call them DMVs in, in archaeology. Uh, they're defined by national monuments as an abandoned medieval settlement dating from the 13th to the 16th century um, and consisting of a group of houses in close proximity with associated land plots, usually associated with a parish church and or a castle or tower house. Um, and they are often ed evident as earthworks on the landscape. So what would they look like on the landscape? So typically um, through aerial imagery or geophys, um, you'd be looking for a layout of long rectangular house plots, um, perhaps with houses at the front laid out either side of a long narrow hollow, e.g. a road. So there's a very typical uh, layout, they're very recognisable on the landscape. Um, and this one is Gainsthorpe, which I'm totally mispronouncing, I apologise, uh, in, in Lincolnshire in England. Um, and it's one of the best preserved examples of, of a DMV in England. Um, but it's a good example of what a deserted village could look like through their imagery if they were looking for them. This one is at Ballantubber um, in County Roscommon. So this is an example of what could be visible through the use of geophysical surveys. So you can see here, this is a really good example, I love this one. But the, you can see here that there is a hollow way running down the center and you have these long rectangular plots. These are what I mean. Um, and they're, they're really recognizable. This pattern is, is really easy to spot. So you can find a huge amount of these DMV sites um, in England, like a quick Google search brings up so many of them and um, most of them are on the English Heritage website and there's various projects uh, and websites you can visit but in Ireland there is there's an existing gap in our knowledge of desired medieval villages and um, for some well-known ones like Rindoon in Roscommon um, and it attracts a lot of attention probably due to the number of upstanding remains and um, that survive at the site. I should also mention that um, this study it's changing in recent years for example the Discovery Programme have had an ongoing project on these site types and I will be talking about that a little later. But there's still a huge amount to be found out here um, on these site types in County Loud. Currently on the National Monuments database, there's only three uh, recorded DMVs. This is including Castle Roach. There's one at Piperstown in the southeast of the county and Stormstown situated northwest of RD. Only one of these have been ever archaeologically investigated. Um, and that's Piperstown, which was excavated by Professor Terry Barry in 1987. And I think um, this is because you know, in the past, in terms of medieval archaeology, attention was paid more to high status houses, castles, monastic sites, understandably, uh, in terms of visible runes and technologies available to scholars at the time, like most DMVs only survive as subsurface features on the landscape. They're not visible to the naked eye. But recent developments in archaeological sciences and remote sensing in particular has led to more research interest in the less visible remains of our past, such as desert medieval villages. So both the castle itself and this deserted medieval village site at Roach are the focus of this project. And now I'm going to talk to you about the project for a little bit. So it's a collaboration between um, Dr. Karen Dempsey, who is a medieval archaeologist and a postdoc researcher at NYG, Dr. Connor Brady, um, a lecturer in GKT with a range of expertise, including landscape archaeology. And myself, I'm a field archaeologist and I specialize in medieval and community archaeology. Back in, in early 2021, uh, Karen contacted the Council of the, of the Loud Archaeological Historical Society about the possibility of doing some sort of ca uh, project at Castle Roach. Um, one of Karen's ongoing research projects has been looking at high status women in medieval society. She also looks at medieval castles and houses, and so of course Roach is particularly interesting to her with the Rohesia the Virgin connection. Um, and when I heard about this, I just jumped at the chance to get involved, really. Um, Roach Castle, as we always call it locally, it's been always been of interest to me. I'm from Dundalk, if you can't tell by my accent. And I haven't visited this castle since I was a child. Um, I've also been working on various medieval sites um, for years. And so, but I'm based in County Mead uh, for work. So I was really excited to work on something closer to home. Um, so myself and Connor and Karen uh, had a chat about the castle and decided to carry out some research, see what we could find out more 
see what we could find out about the castle itself, but also its, its immediate environment. Um, so at Roach, there have been no, no excavations have ever been carried out. Um, and so, as, and as far as we know, no geophysical survey has ever been carried out. And I'm saying none that we've ever found anyway. Um, yeah, so we're, we're not 100% sure on that, but no reports that, I, that I've been able to come across. So, so far, we've only been able to use what is above ground um, to, make, to make sense of this monument. And so the reveal in which the project um, was established. So using geophysical survey, the project intends to reveal the immediate layout of the castle buildings, as well as the wider castle complex. So the project endeavors to shed light on the intentions of its patron, Regent Virgin, and ascertain if as some sources suggest there was an associated settlement. So to do any of this, um, we of course needed to think about funding. <laughs> Um, and so we were very grateful to receive funding from both the Royal Irish Academy um, and the Society for Medieval Archaeologists um, to carry out the survey. We managed to get enough funding to be able to do uh, detailed gradiometer and resistance surveys, which were carried out in three areas, covering an area of two hectares. So the, area, the areas we were able to cover were, were um, this area within the curtain wall, the large plateau to the east of the castle, um, and then the lower ground to the north, uh, northeast and northwest of the castle. And so the aim of this survey was to identify any responses which may represent like previously unknown archaeological remains within uh, these areas, but in particular to identify features such as buildings and adjacent spaces which may have functioned as gardens um, that may be associated with the castle and reported deserted medieval settlement. So this is our little team um, at the castle last year. Um, so we did the survey in August 2021. I'll be probably in trouble for showing this picture. <laughs> it's the only one I could find. But um, this is Karen at the front, uh, Dr. Karen Dempsey. That's me. Uh, that's Con Dr. Connor Brady, for anyone who doesn't know him. And Dr. Susan Curran, who carried out the geophysical survey on behalf of Jolie uh, Surveys Limited. So um, just to talk a little bit about geophysical survey um, and, and how it works. So the equipment here is the equipment we use obviously for the survey, but on the left here is used for the resistivity and on the, on the right is the gradiometer. Um, so geophysical survey enables archeologists to investigate the subterranean remains of an archeological site in a non-invasive capacity. So the main types of geophysical survey we use are resistivity, radiometry slash magnetometry, and GPR, ground penetrating radar. And the methods chosen for survey are usually based on constraints like funding and time, um, what you're trying to achieve. So like, what, what are you looking for? Uh, and, and finally, most importantly, the terrain you're working with. So as I said before, Castle Roach is built on a large rocky outcrop. Um, and Susan, who did our survey, she did a tremendous amount of work with a small amount of help from us, but mostly by herself. Um, and it was really on difficult ground conditions. You have steep slopes, rocky terrain and outcrops uh, and long grass. So we weren't really sure how the geophysics would work. Um, and if, if the only responses we, could, we would get would be maybe just from the actual natural geology rather than archeological features. So that was a really interesting aspect. Um, but both resistivity and gradiometry were used on almost the entire area. So um, as you can see here, um, detailed gradiometer and resistance surveys were carried out in three areas. Like I said, the area within the cotton wall, area A, the area of the large plateau to the east of the castle, area B, and then that lower ground to the north as well, area C. The gradiometer was undertaken throughout all of the areas A, B, and C. And so that's the green. Um, a detailed gradiometer survey detects subtle variations in the local magnet magnetic field. So archeological features such as ditches, Large pits and fired uh, features have an enhanced magnetic signal and can be, can be detected through a recorded survey. So data was collected with an instrument uh, specifically designed for use in archaeological prospection. Um, it was collected with sample intervals of 0 0.25 meters and a transverse interval of one meter, but this provided 6,400 readings per 40 meter by 40 meter grid. The resistance survey focused on areas A and B and just a small part of area C. Um, so that's the immediate below the eastern extent of the, of the plateau. So a deep resistance survey is used to record variations um, in electrical resistance by passing electrical current through ground. So the subsequent air resistance is recorded and then presented a map form for interpretation. Resistance surveys are typically conducted on site where structural or stone features are anticipated. 
So detailed resistance survey was conducted um, and data was collected with a parallel twin probe array of mobile and remote electrodes. The resistance survey mobile probes were separated by 0 0.5 meters. In area A, data was collected with a sample interval of 0 0.5 meters uh, and a transverse interval of 0 0.5 meters. In areas B and C, was collected with a sample interval of 0 0.5 meters and a transverse interval of uh, one meter. So the survey took eight days um, to complete. This is Susan doing the survey. Um, so over the so course of the survey had been carried out, we did try and publicize uh, this project as much as we could uh, and, and community outreach was really important to us. So posts, social media posts were published on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, through the profiles of County Loud Archaeological and Historical Society, the Blackfriar Archaeology Fields Group, which is my own company, and Dr. Karen Dempsey's own social media. The survey took place during Heritage Week. So site tours were given, um, while the survey was going on, we were able to give site tours to members of, of the County Loud Archaeological and Historical Society. Um, this took place on August 17th, and 44 people actually turned up, which was just amazing. We were, we were really chuffed by that. Um, and also an interview then was given by, da by Karen Dempsey to the Irish Examiner, and this was published on the 18th of August, um, and that gave great publicity to the project. We were really chuffed with that. Now, so to the results of the survey, the moment everybody's been waiting for. Um, so the, the geophysical survey results have, uh, they reveal several areas of um, archaeological potential, and you can see all of these different highlighted areas on this map. Um, in area A, we'll just zoom in a little bit, um, the area, this is the area comprising of the castle itself, and this area surveyed was defined by the, the sub-triangle or curtain wall, the rectangular hall to the south, uh, and, the, and the rectangular hall to the south. So structural remains um, obstructed the survey in places, so it was just places she just couldn't get in, um, but overall the ground conditions were really good. So um, the remains of up to three possible structures um, have been identified, um, and that's where you see A, B, and C here. Um, and these include a linear feature to the western half, which may represent the remains of the wall. So that's B, that's this one here. Um, and, a fr and fragmented responses, which point to the presence of possible structural remains at the southern extent. So just down here, down here. Um, so these responses. These responses identified may represent the rubble remains of uh, former buildings. This, so this could be pointing towards buildings such as um, chapel or you know accommodation and such. Um, a response adjacent to the north and northern wall of the sub-rectangular freestanding uh, structure is indicative of burning. So that's this is the freestanding structure. So this would be the area of burning, um, and this may represent a, a spread of burnt material. A number of possible isolated pit type features were also picked up. Um, within the cotton walls, but there's no clear pattern to them, so it's hard to say what, what they might be. Um, but in the area of the hall over here, you can see where all this, all these little yellow marks. Um, this, rep this is dominated by an area of increased magnetic response, but this area, um, if you haven't been to the castle, it kind of drops in, it's very flat, it's very even, so no clear responses were evident, so nothing was picked up, and this is probably due to the area being just repeatedly flattened and leveled over time. So in area B, area surveyed, this area was surveyed comprised of the entire plateau and then part of the rock hut ditch here. And um, ground conditions here were poor due to long grass and bedrock protruding from the ground, particularly in the eastern half. So this hampered the survey. Just outside the castle, within the southern moat, so in this area here, uh, responses were detected on the raised area immediately adjacent to the castle entrance and east of the rectangular hall. A rock outcrop is visible in this area and appears to have been modified to a rectilinear shape. Um, this area lies directly beneath a garter rope shoot, and it's possible that the responses in this area may be associated with that. Uh, within the plateau of the in uh, the east to the east of the castle, possible rectilinear and curvilinear stru structures have been identified. So this is the the interesting stuff. Um, so high resistance, uh, high resistance responses suggestive of a rectilinear wall structure are consistent with the location of a possible spread of burnt material close to the southwestern edge of the plateau. Um, so this is this area here. Um, and the remains of a former structure could be here measuring 20 meters by 12 meters and oriented approximately north to south. Um, about 10 meters east of this, so over here, um, this is a possible second structure, uh, demarcated by low resistance and positive magnetic responses, which are generally indicative of ditched features. 
So these are two linear features running parallel. You can see the two blue lines here. I hope you can see that with my mouse, but the two blue lines here. Um, they're demarcating an area of 26 metres by 26 metres, um, and they're also roughly oriented north to south. So it's possible that this represents the remains of a second structure, but possibly the foundation trenches rather than the, the structure of the walls themselves. Um, about 12 metres to the north, so up here, there is, um, sorry, this one, this number nine here. Um, this is a third possible rectilinear structure, much smaller. Um, it measures about 12 metres by five metres. It's not represented on the resistance survey and the magnetic response is poorly defined. So it's, it's, a, vague, uh, it's a vague feature. Also three potential semi-circular um, structures here uh, were picked up, um, one of which is visible on the ground as a raised semi-circular semi area. All three are located on the western half of the plateau in the vicinity of the castle. And so it's fair to say that they might represent structures that are you know, more than likely associated with the castle itself. So this is this area north of the castle, um, and so this area comprises of the lower ground to the northwest. And um, if you if you have if you've been to the castle, you'll know the area you're talking about. It's, it's much lower down, and um, but this is the area to the northwest, north and north of the castle. And the ground conditions were very difficult here, uh, particularly along the western side. And that's why this survey kind of drops off here. She just couldn't get uh, any more done here. Um, so a possible ditch feature is evident uh, on both the gradiometer and the resistance survey. So that's why I've left B here as well. So this ditch is carrying in from area B to C. Um, and so the foot, so it's continuing from the higher ground of the plateau into the lower ground of area C. So for a ditch feature to continue across the change in elevation, I think would be unusual. Um, but the gap in the survey data due to the steep slope and rock outcrops means that it couldn't be traced as a, as a continue, possible continuous feature. Um, also in area C, possible rectilinear and curved linear features uh, have been identified on the lower slope. So this is, um, where are we? This is this area here. Um, so these may represent, and these are just, but then as may represent ditch features. Um, but multiple, multiple responses within areas A, B, and C are ind indicative of burn and an archeological pit type and burn features. So we're picking these up in each area. And uh, no clear pattern is evident, but they are suggestive of archaeological features and activity. However, uh, we should say that an archaeological interpretation of all of this is cautious, and um, given the response of the underlying geology, it's just you, you just we couldn't really confirm. Not, not none of these features can be confirmed with that archaeological excavation, to put it simply. And um, so it's all speculative at this time. So what does this all mean for Castle Roach? Um, well, a valuable data set has been collected now, um, which I hope provides further insights into the subsurface remains um, of this medieval landscape um, at Roach. So in area A, inside the curtain walls, unsurprisingly, features were picked up. Um, archaeological excavation of these features could supply the necessary data of the features that were detected to answer the questions about the original layout of the castle and also its use and period of occupation. In areas B and C, where we can see um, we can see the features here, which also could be further, further explored through excavation. But these features may represent buildings. They could be represent, represent buildings associated with the use of the castle. Um, but some of these features, particularly the ditches, may represent evidence of an earlier pre-Norman site here. But the biggest takeaway for me, I think, is that the so-called deserted medieval village just doesn't seem to be on the eastern plateau. I don't think, anyway. <laughs> um, so does that mean it never existed? Well, no. Um, I think it's more likely that if it's there, it's in the lower fields, perhaps to the east or the north. Um, so maybe it would be great to look at kind of these kind of areas. Um, if you've ever been up to Roach on a windy day, I don't think you would want to have a village up that high. Um, you'd rather be lower down, in the, still in the protected shelter of the castle. Um, but when you're looking at the landscape, you know, we should be thinking about things like where is the land more fertile? Where is the water source? Where would there have been an existing route way if there was one? These are the kind of things that might point us in the right direction if we are looking for a medieval, um, a medieval village. So I think the next step would be to do more geophysical survey um, in, the, in the surrounding fields to see if, if any evidence of the village could be identified. So as I said earlier, um, deserted medieval villages, they are somewhat understudied in Ireland, but this has been changing in recent years. 
So the Discovery Programme have a pro project called the Medieval Rural Settlement Project. So this can be checked out on the discoveryprogram.ie. The Medieval Rural Settlement Project set out to examine the places where um, people lived after the arrival of the Anglo-Normans in Ireland until the end of the medieval period. So they examined the settlement, um, examined the settlement both in the areas where land was granted to Anglo-Norman uh, lords and set with English and Welsh tenants, and then also areas which were largely under Irish control. The project was divided into three main areas, um, and these were Roscommon, Carlow, and Dublin. But one of the sites um, in Carlow um, by doctors Neil Brady and Margaret Muffy is Castle Moor. And I think this is a really, Castle Moor is a really interesting site to look at when you are thinking about, when we are thinking about the evidence of a borough at Roach. So a Castle Moor, um, a Martin Bailey castle survives close to a small churchyard and is taught to mark the cent this is taught to mark the centre of a settlement that was established in the 13th century and no longer visible on the landscape. The site of Castle Moor was selected for study because the land is still under arable cultivation and field walking of the ploughed fields allowed the project to collect large quantities of uh, medieval pottery and um, the distribution of which suggested a lost settlement. Um, there's also extensive documentary records for the site with a series of nine annual accounts that survived for the manor. So they investigated this site using geophysical area, a ge geophysical survey and they covered a really big area and you can see it here. Um, so this is Castle Moor, this is taken um, and uh, the site, this hasn't been published, the site hasn't actually been published yet, but there's a really good lecture online by Neil Brady uh, where he talks about the project, um, if anyone's interested. But you can see here the geophys is superimposed on an aerial image. Um, and the, the image, but I did say the image is from the Skipper Program website. I'm just making sure I'm getting my credits in there. But you can see the sheer magnitude of what's going on below the surface. Like this is amazing. Um, you can see these features that I talked about. So these long rectangular features. Um, plots and houses, the road, the modern road today actually follows the line of the main street of the medieval village, which is really interesting um, to see. But like I said, this is a large area um, where a gradiometer survey was carried out and it shows what's possible. They managed to ca capture the footprint of almost the entire settlement, um, which is a classically laid out medieval Anglo-Norman village slash manor. So Neil also mentioned in his lecture that they captured earlier features and um, site, you know, site stating to, to earlier pre-Norman, uh, the pre-Norman landscape, which is really interesting too. So the future of Castle Roach. So what's next for Castle Roach? Well, Castle Roach is undoubtedly one of the archaeological gems of County Loud, definitely. Um, and I think it's important that we do our best to keep it that way. Um, but what is the future of this monument? And how do we cope with the increasing number of visitors to a site which does not have facilities for, for that kind of traffic? So the landowner, is a local farmer, he's very tolerable. I think he often puts up a car's block and field entrances and more concerningly, visitors camping inside the castle walls, often leaving remnants of fire and litter behind them. Metal detectors have been spotted up at this castle and there's several holes were dug um, in an area inside the curtain walls. But at the same time, the site is treasured by local people. It attracts so many families, so many uh, amateur photographers, hobbyists coming up all the time. So it's, it's really valued, I think, by the community. Um, and I think with all this, it's clear that we should be doing our best to protect a monument like this. Um, so I think it would be great to develop a community archaeology project up at this site as a way of continuing research while protecting it for future generations. Um, community archaeology in Ireland has taken off uh, in the last decade. A lot of types of projects around uh, the country, and I think Loud would benefit from more projects like this. I know there are already some uh, really great community heritage projects in Loud. I'm definitely not saying that there isn't, but at the same time, you know, we haven't seen any community digs really, or correct me if I'm wrong, please, but we haven't seen any community digs. Um, and when you look at what's going on in counties like Mead and in North County Dublin, like there's definitely space for more. Um, thanks to the Heritage Council, there's great resources and funding opportunities for local community groups to look after monuments like Roach. So there's the Adopt a Monument Scheme, that's a good example. Um, community Monuments Fund, um, that's a fantastic resource for heritage projects. Um, and I think we're in a place right now where heritage is getting decent funding, let's say, from our government. I think we should be taking advantage of that right now, to be quite honest. Um, but yeah, there's so many things we could look at for Roach, uh, you know, for community project and for funding. You could look at improving site facilities, putting fencing up, putting signs up, 
gates, a car park would be great for the site. The landowner's genuinely interested in all this kind of stuff and has, has chatted to me about ha having a car park up there. So that's brilliant that they're, you know, so interested in developing it for visitors. Um, but in terms of research as well, that there's so much that could be done um, as a community group. An interesting development actually in, in technologies used to record uh, buildings is computerized 3D mod modeling. And I should say here that a colleague of mine, former colleague of mine, an, Ameri an American university professor is very interested in laser scanning Castle Roach. Um, he actually wanted to do it this summer, but unfortunately the castle's closed for, for repairs to the North Tower, Tower by the OPW. Um, but he comes to Ireland every summer, works on various monuments he's done Shannon Castle. Um, and so I'd hope next summer he might be able to do Roach if we, if we of course, get permission. Um, but there's so many other things to do, like a systematic collection of local history and its accounts would be good. There's so few historical records, um, so I think that would be really interesting. Uh, more geophysical survey, like I said earlier. So yeah, more geophysical survey around this area would be really interesting. Um, also, again, looking at that pre-normal landscape too. A field work and survey around the castle, I think, would be great. Uh, Michal actually mentioned in his lecture that he and Paul Gosling had collected some archaeological material from slippage around the perimeter of the castle. And so I think a field work and exercise um, would be would be really useful um, in this area. I was actually in the National Museum last week. I was looking at the topographical files for another project. And while I was there, I decided to look at Roach, as you do. Um, and there are seven entries for... Um, for fine surface finds um, in, for the townland of Roach, and six of them come from inside the castle themselves. You can see here the dates on which they were found in NMI numbers, and um, found in uh, Roach Castle inside the central well, outside the southwest wall, outside the southwest wall of the well, sorry, um, disturbed soil, north of possible keep. Um, and these are things like an iron spur fragment, um, medieval pottery mostly, medieval pottery, lead musket ball. Um, and then there's also another find from the townland, which wasn't found in the castle, but it was found in a field called Lac Namadi. I don't know if anybody knows that, but I've never heard of it. But um, I, the, I, the find was a copper alloy ring pin, actually, which is really interesting. I think found by the landowners themselves. So I think a field walk and ex uh, survey exercise would be really useful for picking up survey finds, uh, or surface finds, sorry. And um, yeah, and the, the thing I have to mention again as well is excavation, obviously. <laughs> Um, collectively, the geophysics and, and the known ar archaeology strongly advocate for the rest of investigations through exca excavation. Um, the excavation up there could confirm the origin of some of the features detected during the geophysical survey. Um, due to the nature of the geology of the area, like excavation is needed to confirm uh, the authenticity of some of the features discovered during the survey. So I think a community excavation up here would be, would be brilliant. But, but excavation is very expensive, and so we might park that one for now. Um, but I could keep rattling on here about what else we could do at Roach. There's so much. Um, but the point is, the castle could be studied from a variety of perspectives, spatial analysis, scientific data, and social theory, cultural identity. The buildings up there, they embody a way of life on the limits of the Anglo-Norman Pale in the medieval period. And it's just so important to find out, I think, as much as we can. I think with the development of the community project um, with and with the continued support of the landowners, the OPW, the National Monument Service, the County Loud Archaeological and Historical Society, the archaeologists and the community, um, if all these stakeholders work together, we continue researching this castle and landscape while protecting and conserving it um, for the future. So I just want to Take the time now to thank everybody who has supported the project, specifically the funders, Royal Irish Academy, Society for Medieval Archaeologists, the National Monument Service, um, and the Office of Public Works for their permissions and support, the County Loud Archaeological and Historical Society, and particularly Michal McKeown for his help, um, and most importantly, the landowners, the Quigleys, they were such a great help, so supportive. They genuinely want to look after this castle. They encourage researchers to come. It's, it's really good. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks for, thanks for listening to me, everyone.